So good afternoon all, we are going to, to start. Welcome to this uh, lightning talks, uh, putting people at the center of the healthcare system. Uh, this is quite a relevant topic and I'm quite thrilled to listen to your presentations during uh, these uh, 90 minutes. Uh, we will have all the presentations at first, uh, each speaker will present during five minutes and at the end we will have our Q&A. Uh, for the colleagues that are uh, at home, you can also use the app to put your questions and we will uh, uh, catch them up uh, at the end of all presentations. Uh, my name is Alexandre Lourenço, I'll be moderating this uh, session. I come from Portugal, I'm an hospital manager. And uh, this topic is really something that we need to be focused on. Uh, and thank you so much for the speakers for having the time to, to present their experiences around the world. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Meret Khalil. She's coming from WJO EMRO uh, and she will speak about exposing obstetric violence to improve rights-based and respectful full maternal care in the Eastern Mediterranean region, WJO. Meret. Hello everybody, thank you all for being here and uh, thank you doctor for your kind introduction. Um, can we get the slides up please? So, as you can see, my name is Mirat Khalil, I'm from Egypt. Um, I am the founder of a small organization that does advocacy on respectful maternal care called Your Egyptian Doula. I'm also a consultant with the World Health Organization, the regional office in Cairo. Today I'm talking to you about exposing obstetric violence to improve rights-based and respectful maternal care in the region. Thank you. Next, please. So I want to start today's very quick lightning talk by telling you a story. This is the story of Sarah. Sarah is a woman from our region. She's pregnant. She is going to have her baby. And at about 39 weeks, she goes to her appointment very normally, very good. Maybe this, this will work. Ah, voila. And her doctor at 39 weeks tells her, ah, come tomorrow, we will schedule you for an induction and let's get this going. Sarah is perfectly healthy. She has no reason to think there's any issues with her and her baby. Her provider starts scaring her that if we don't go for this intervention, if we don't go for this birth immediately at 39 weeks, something might happen to her or her baby outside of any typical condition. She's scared, so she says, definitely, okay, who am I to do anything wrong to myself or to the health of my baby? And she goes to the hospital. Intervention after intervention after intervention, the doctor and the medical team decide, nope, we have given her the maximum amount of Pitocin, the maximum amount of induction at 39 weeks. There's no more, we can't do anything else. We have to go for a cesarean section. Sarah feels like she's on the table. She is having an operation done onto her body. No one is talking to her. No one is really telling her what's happening. Uh, no one is asking for her permission before putting needles in her body, before giving her medications. But all she's thinking about is my baby. I need to make sure my baby is okay. So she stays quiet, she's praying, she's reflecting, she's thinking about meeting her little one. She's a new mom for the first time. And this is typically what the picture would look like. This is a vaginal birth, obviously, but you can imagine the situation. So after the delivery, alhamdulillah, Sarah is fine, her baby is fine. And then she's reflecting, oh, everything is okay, everything went well. And a few hours after the delivery, when finally she's able to hold her baby and look at her baby and have this moment finally of skin to skin, she realizes that was intense. That was maybe too much. What just happened? So this leads us to a very quick overview of what are women's rights in childbirth? What is respectful maternal care? This is actually a, a human right. As you can see from this table, in about 2010, there was an initial landscape analysis conducted by Bowser and Hill to introduce this concept of human rights in childbirth. They identified seven areas of disrespect and abuse in childbirth, as you can see from the first column. These uh, range from physical abuse all the way to detention due to financial um, limitations. Each of these different categories of disrespect and abuse correspond to one or more human rights. We conducted a study in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, it was a, a systematic review from a women-centered lens. What are women saying about their experiences giving birth across the region? And as you probably have heard throughout this conference, the Eastern Mediterranean region is very diverse. 
in terms of health system strength, in terms of income, in terms of really the types of medical systems that exist. We range from Morocco to Pakistan, with incomes varying from Djibouti, Afghanistan to the Emirates, which inshallah we will see you all there next year. So in the themes that we identified from this review, the two most common typologies of obstetric violence in the region were physical abuse, specifically the overuse of routine interventions. In Egypt, for example, this is cesarean sections, or it was reported across the literature from many women across the region, whether this could be um, episiotomies that were routinely used, inductions, etc., as well as type four, non-dignified care. Women felt like their healthcare providers were disrespecting them, treating them like objects, treating them like you're just laying there, we will do the operation and make sure you and your baby are fine. But really no one is speaking to you like a human that is being transformed into a mother, a parent in that moment. So really those were the two uh, that were identified. So let's talk very quickly about what is obstetric violence. I know this is quite a small figure, but you'll see the inner circle there, it says disrespect and abuse in childbirth. This is actually a proxy for obstetric violence. You'll see obstetric violence across the bottom, it intersects with all of the different layers. Obstetric violence Merit is- time, please. Yes, it's a systemic problem. It's institutional, it's embedded. It's a form of GBV that not only violates respectful maternal care, but it also violates quality of maternal care and evidence-based practices. It's embedded in the health systems. The implications of this are terrifying. One in three women face birth trauma globally. The reported data shows 12 to 98% obstetric violence globally. The implications of this is that we are continuing to normalize these violations as standard intrapartum care, whether this is at the community level with underreporting, whether this is the continuation of these practices, or whether this is a passivity towards human rights violations at the policy level. So where do we go from here? We need to eliminate obstetric violence, obviously, because it violates high quality of care, respectful maternal care, and human rights. We need to do this through policy and advocacy at the highest level of government and also at the community level. We need to do this through women-centered service delivery and there are many interventions that can be implemented at a, at a small cost. We need to implement and utilize multidisciplinary teams. We need to scale up nursing and midwifery across the region. And of course, we need implementation research on this topic. So I want to close with one question. Leaving your hospital, does the story begin with happy birthday or does it begin with a trauma? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Merit, for the, this insightful presentation. Um, I will uh, now call the Clara Rios. She's an architect. She's coming from Spain, and she will uh, present a new ICU model. Um, well, hello. Good good morning. Uh, you think what is an architect doing here? Well. <laughs> First of all, since I'm from Barcelona, uh, it's easy to come in this uh, international congress. But uh, I would like to, to explain what is our role and how we can uh, improve and, and work together with uh, physicians and with people working on hospitals. And I would say um, people on the center. For us, this is our mantra, uh, working on projects, uh, thinking with um, people, with patients, with professionals, with staff. That has to be uh, that have to work or be in this uh, in in all the hosp um, hospital or, or healthcare um, environments. Um, I'm just gonna um, give you a few ideas of a project we did. Is a uh, the ICU the hepatic ICU uh, from the hospital clinic here in Barcelona. In Barcelona. Uh, we worked uh, since the very beginning with a multidisciplinary team. Uh, it was really challenging. Uh, they wanted to do a change of model, and but the, 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 I think that the key was to work from the very beginning with uh, everyone. Uh, so all the ideas were uh, on the table, and we could work uh, together uh, with with all the staff and also with the engineering team, with people from the hospital. Mm, we worked in two main um, keys, the security and comfort. Uh, first of all, security, of course, we were working in an ICU and how to, to um, uh, all the infections that, uh, that can be in the ICU, it was a matter of how to lower them. So we worked with this uh, furniture that uh, are two, two, uh, sharing with two rooms and this is where we centralize everything. So we were uh, thinking uh, with the staff how could we do this furniture that everything was, uh, was centered. There's the washing hand. Uh, without washing hands, uh, doors do not open. <laughs> so this was uh, one of the, the main ideas they had. 
also there is all the um, all the space to have the gloves to have the soap and, and all the electricity so they are mm, things are not in the corridors just misplaced so everything is centered this is a way that um, people working there know where to go and everything is on the place and also from the inside there's a as there's also all the controls um, air conditioning lighting and also the waste disposal you can uh, put your waste from the inside and the cleaning staff can go from the outside so they don't have to go inside this is uh, to prevent infections then as uh, to lower the opening doors about the comfort um, we work with uh, natural materials they are really not natural this is not real wood uh, for obvious uh, cleaning cleaning issues but we work with uh, with wood with uh, colors that uh, are um, natural colors uh, also we we put the room the the bed uh, sometimes they are like placed with a window uh, on your back so we put them we place them parallels to the facade so the patient could, uh, could look uh, outside the window and also to the corridor. So this is a way um, they don't uh, they, they get well well they don't get uh, disorientated on time uh, on where they are. Uh, you know about the delirious on the ICU patients. Uh, also important to know uh, to look outside and see uh, if it's dark, if it's uh, raining, if it's night, if it's day, they really don't know. Uh, the, the, the temporary disorientation is very common. And uh, also uh, we had some, the single rooms, okay, in public uh, hospitals it's really common to have double rooms, so they really uh, had, to, we really wanted single rooms. And uh, there's this project, that's the picture on top to the right, it's uh, on the music, how people, uh, musicians, volunteer musicians go there and play some music. And of course this, you can do it with single rooms, because you don't know what the, uh, the other patient is going to like or not. And also we, we, did, uh, we placed a, a magnetic wall, finish. So this is the, the, the patient uh, wall where um, he, he could uh, or she could uh, put, uh, hang up some pictures. Usually this, uh, the patients are uh, quite a, a long stay in this ICU. So it's a way that the patient don't, don't lose, uh, well, they, they, they can have the, the loved ones with them. Of course, they also have iPads and TVs, but it's a way to personalize a little bit. So how we can think about the uh, people on the center, it's uh, the, the, main, the main idea. Um, also, well, this bed, uh, this, is a sing this is a small one, and actually this bed is put, uh, the, the contrary thing that I said, um, but how we, we could manage to, to integrate all the technology. Time, Clara. Yeah, and this is the entrance. Uh, I just want to put uh, a thing on the biophilic design. Uh, in a hospital, uh, it's a really, um, it's a city hospital, it's um, hard, I mean, what you see outside is not, they are not trees. So we try to put some pictures of trees. When you enter, you're laying down, what you see is a forest, not just a, a white uh, ceiling. And, and really uh, an open space for the staff to work, not just a counter, but to work, to help the disciplinary uh, work. and. Um, really fast. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. For me. Uh, I will call now Dr. Sami Yusuf. Thank you, sir. He's the CEO uh, of the Health Care Leadership Academy at the Saudi Commission of Health Specialties, Saudi Arabia. Hello, good morning, and thank you for being with us today. And thank you for in the, the introduction. Uh, I would like also to extend my thanks to all the architects for creating a piece of uh, magnificent uh, city like Barcelona and all of the architecture in Barcelona. And happy to be with you this year here in Barcelona. I'm going to be presenting today about uh, the KSA vision uh, leading the way for change in human humanistic leadership across the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So, a little piece about the Healthcare Leadership Academy. We're in the business of developing healthcare leaders. And we believe that this is uh, something that has to be done in a very specific manner. It should be personalized. It should be specific. It should be customized. So over the past three years, we have been doing a lot of work to make sure that we 
produced the best outcomes in terms of leadership training. And this paper is one of the efforts that we have done to improve uh, the way that we understand leadership training in the healthcare sector and the requirements for healthcare leadership training. So if I can have the next slide, please. You have a pointer there? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So it's me? Yeah. Right. So, and KSA is undergoing a massive transformation for the healthcare, one of the biggest in the world right now, a 10 year program to reform the entire healthcare structure. And that's probably one of the drivers for establishing a leadership academy in the, in the region. The relationship from a key component of leadership is everything. This is what we do in our place of work and it involves people, and people who, are people who are the ones who are going to conduct this transformation. So the humanistic approach is a critical element of the teachings uh, that we do, uh, and it's the sixth strand of our healthcare reform. We promise to offer a fulfilling and healthy life for our population. In this session, I will describe the critical elements of the Vision 2030 for the healthcare reform program and how, what we are doing to develop capacity and healthcare leaders across the system. So the Vision 2030, uh, and I say this, I quote this from our reform program. Our goal is to enhance the standards as well as the quality of healthcare services in Saudi Arabia. And the public sector will focus on planning, regulatory, and supervisory skills instead of delivering of healthcare delivery. Uh, and it will deepen collaboration and integration between health and social care. So we're moving from treatment to prevention. We're moving from institutions into systems. We're moving from fragmentation into integration. And we're moving from passive citizen into an active citizen who is really involved in the healthcare delivery. Trust is at the center of this transformation. So for us, we think that trust is essential and it needs ethics, compassion, and collective value and vision. And the rational leadership styles encompasses adaptability. So we need an adapt adaptable leaders. We need people who are responsive and wise, and we need resilience within the healthcare system and within individuals themselves. The key pillars of the humanistic approach that we're talking about are five pillars. So we believe that the humanistic approach needs to have reflection. So our leaders need to be able to know themselves and to reflect. It needs to have responsibility and accountability. And this is each and every one of us uh, in the system should have this. And mark and take responsibility for their part of care to achieve the vision that we're looking for. Mutual accountability, which is team-based, it's critical in aligning every line, uh, frontline performance with the corporate mission. So we're connecting frontliners to the, to the mission itself. Empowerment, so we need to create a climate and culture within our healthcare system that empowers uh, people to achieve uh, the goal and the mission of the transformation and reform without the bureaucratic constraints. And finally, enablement. So we need to enable, this needs to be embodied within the humanistic uh, sense of leadership. And it takes time to develop, we know, but we are taking a long-term approach to build this within our healthcare system. We have devised, based on this, for this purpose, we have devised a leadership model specific for our healthcare system. And it revolves around two pillars, which are care and accountability. And it has five themes Time. and 18 behavioral uh, areas. And each one of these areas has specific expectations at three different levels. So we have one for frontliners, one for middle managers, and one for senior executives. And this is what we envision success will look like. We'll have leaders who are exceptional who can achieve the triple aim of health, which is improving experience of care, health of population, and reducing our per capita spending in our system, and who can also achieve the quadruple aim of health, uh, which also includes focusing on the wellness at work. Our research has shown that uh, there, are, there is an absence of informed literature uh, concerning accountability, which is one of the major things that we see in, in humanistic leadership. 
in comparison to collective leadership, which is, has extensive uh, literature. Exceptional uh, leaders were required to be both accountable and collective, uh, and, and have collective leadership approaches. Uh, humanistic leadership will grow through relationships, representing the foundation at the individual level, and transformational leadership. And our research program will focus on aligning both individual and collective leadership within adaptive and system-based framework in Saudi Arabia. So wish us luck. It's a huge uh, mission, but we have like three years to do it uh, and have this uh, in applied on practice. So thank you for listening to this. And I hope I see you in the next one in Dubai, inshallah. Mm. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Sami. I will now ask Marta Cardoner. Uh, she's a PR and a communication director at the Fundación Sanitaria Molet, also from Spain. Uh, and she's going to present the social approach of healthcare institutions. 10 years of experience. It's possible to have, well, hello, I'm very glad to be here. As he said, I'm Marta Cardone, Communications and PI Director at Fundación Sanitaria Mollet. Uh, today I'm here to talk about our social project, a project designed to contribute to the social needs in our territory. First, I think it's necessary to understand, oh, sorry, better. <laughs> I think it is necessary to understand uh, who we are. Fundación Sanitaria Mollet is a non-profit organization that provides public health and social service near Barcelona. It is made up of an, an university acute care hospital, a palliative and rehabilitation hospital, and three residents, two for the elderly and one for people with intellectual disabilities. Our main purpose is to improve our people's life but life in a global concept, not just their health, but their life in all its dimensions, biological, physical, social, emotional, and even spiritual. Because health, it's not, the, the, it's not just the healthcare system. We have to take into account, as you know, another determinants of health. For example, in our territory, Social problems affect health and healthcare system. Social problems such as poverty, mental health, or homelessness. And despite the comprehensive nature of our services, every day we discover problems that we cannot solve. For example, in our territory, the population over 80 years old has doubled in 10 years. And this group of people is especially prone from suffering from the unwanted loneliness or isolation. And these factors are uh, especially worrisome because they aggravate their situation of vulnerability and fragility. To name a few figures more, for example, 9% of population are dependent and 12% are unemployed. This is why our Obra Social Alrora was born to improve the living conditions of vulnerable people in our territory and reduce the social exclusion. And especially for th these three groups of people, the elderly, people with mental health problems, and people with intellectual disabilities. In these last 10 years, Obra Social Alrora has become the soul of Fundación Sanitaria Mollet. The way we want to work, and each symbol is the same 100 years old oak tree that grows next to our hospital. We have three big objectives in this project. First, to improve skills and autonomy of these three groups of people. Second, to ensure basic needs. And third, to promote healthy habits. For the first objective, we have developed and implemented different therapies in our three residents, such as music therapy, animal-assisted therapy, or virtual reality. Each therapy is adapted to the physical, cognitive, or emotional need of each person. For example, virtual reality combines visual elements with music therapy and helps people with Alzheimer to remember their life, to remember their relative, to remember their, their, their home. 
For the second objective, we are working in two big projects. First, the social kitchen that uh, currently gives lunch to people with mental health problems. In fact, the social kitchen is the only space for socializing that these people have right now. Second, the social housing. We develop alliance to get new apartments with contracts adapted to the possibilities of people with mental health problems of our mental health service. These two projects allow us to work against a double social exclusion. First, the social exclusion caused by poverty, and second, the social exclusion caused by mental health problem. This project, these projects also help us to improve the adherence to treatment and relationships with volunteers and professionals. Finally, we keep working to promote healthy lifestyle to enter the population with alliance with councils and media. Currently, we have two social apartments for five, per five people, and we serve food for more than 30 people every day. And more than 200 people are attending our therapies in the residences. In addition to these benefits, we discovered that this, thank you, this social problem has other values. For the patient, because it prevents people from in, for suffering from major health problems, for the community, because it is a querent way to integrate the health institutions to our society. And last but not least, to the professionals, because it increased the corporate pride of them. This is our vision, this is the way we want to work, and in the future, we want to continue to expand uh, this social progress so that it can reach to more people every day. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. I will call Dr. Aigul Kulmekaya Medova. I hope that I'm pronouncing it well. Uh, she's coming from uh, Kazakhstan. No, she's not there. Okay, thank you. So we'll move uh, forward. So I will uh, call now Dr. Jose Quintilla. Quintilla. Yeah. Uh, he's mostly he's going to talk highly realistic clinical simulation to involve field professionals and decisions about work environments and processes. We are <coughs> Good morning. We are very happy to share with you our experience in using highly realistic clinical simulation to uh, involve first-line professionals in the decisions about the system. I come from San Juan de Deu Barcelona Children's Hospital. It's one of the biggest high uh, reference hospital pediatric in Catalonia, Spain, and even Europe. And we have a, a stable relationship with Boston Children's Hospital simulation program, and we share some methodologies. A highly realistic clinical simulation is putting the professionals to work in a simulated, in a simulated environment with real medical equipment, but with, sim with simulated patients, sometimes mannequins, sometimes actors and actresses. It's mostly used for training people, but today I am talking for using the, uh, about using simulation for testing and making decisions about the system. We will follow this is, is a schema, why, how, and, and what, briefly and fast. Um, why? Why using simulation for this purpose? First reason is that it's not the same how we imagine our work, how we write procedures, how we explain the work to others, and how we really do the work. And these four perspectives of work never completely overlap. The second idea is that simulation is a very powerful, a very good opportunity to connect with the five principles uh, of high reliability organizations especially uh, deference to expertise and uh, resilience. And the third big reason is because this is, that is the way that we learn. Individuals, uh, teams and organizations make decisions, uh, gather results, and next time maybe we change something if we get bad results. Let's do with simulation before the things really happen. How? In our hospital, the simulation is not a technique. There is a clinical unit. Uh, 
that provides a service to, the, to all the areas of the hospital. We have a specific structure and we have a model of four service line. One of them is SIM test, and we are, today we are talking about SIM test, testing the system with the si simulation. And we follow a specific methodology with six uh, uh, stages that you can see here. Needs assessment, design process, physical preparation of the activity, execution, analysis of results, and uh, impact evaluation. The key moments are needs assessment, and we always run a multidisciplinary focus group in order to, get, to gather main goal and specific sets of concerns. A second key moment of the process is the execution. We run uh, complex simulations and we have uh, the, the briefing with double loop learning following the model of Argyris from Harvard. And we have a, um, a system for analyzing the results building an OECS matrix. What do we do with simulation? We have run 18 complex uh, projects uh, about testing with simulation since 2014. We have tested workspaces. You can see in the pictures uh, the, test, the test of something that is not already built. We built with cardboard uh, walls and same size than reality, that future reality, and we test the architectural uh, plans. And you can have some examples of testing uh, spaces, processes, and equipment for the hospital. You can read some of them. It's very, it's impossible to uh, share all the data of these uh, experiences in five minutes. But you can see several examples of application. And what kind of decisions we, we have about size of room, about internal layout. We have changed wholly the architectural design of an area of the hospital, about equipment, uh, specific safety risks, dynamics of people, uh, steps in a process, roles, new job positions, validation of hypotheses. What we have learned um, from the using of simulation for this purpose? Just three ideas and I will uh, finish. First idea is that simulation is a very powerful way for frontline professionals to engage in the decisions about the system, about the workspaces and the processes. The second idea is that the contribution of the professionals in the debriefing of simulation are based in experience, very close experience through simulated experience, but it's not the same. They have lived, they are not only thinking or evoking the work the work. And the three idea is that we have observed that it's much easier to achieve consensus about different professionals, for example, clinicians and engineers uh, around simulation that in a traditional meeting. And this is the big mm. idea of using simulation for this purpose that you can read by yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quintilla. Uh, I must say that, that I'm not, I don't have conflict of interest. If you have the time to visit San Juan de Dio Hospital, uh, as you are in Barcelona, please do, because it's probably one of the most innovative hospitals in Europe. Um, I will call now um, Elisinda Camprecios. She's a trained midwife, and she's going to speak about raising awareness to health professionals about emotional needs of families suffering perinatal loss through a short documentary. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to share with you the protocol we did uh, to support the families with uh, perinatal loss in our hospital. We did this protocol together with a multidisciplinary team. The starting point of this protocol was a complaining letter that we received saying that uh, it was not really Mm, something specifically wrong we did, but this family uh, who had a stillbirth in our hospital, um, they said that at uh, some point they thought that the emotional needs uh, we didn't meet. Mm -hmm. This put it into the context of um, the increase of number of association, family associations that gathered together to raise their voice that they need special 
specific um, attention to, to, to be able to, in the future, do a proper um, breathing process. So this makes us realize uh, that we were not doing it properly. We used to have this protocol that based more on the medical issues, and we realized we need to complement it with another one that focus more on the emotional needs. So um, um, when we have a family in the hospital, and they are faced with this dramatically situation where they learn that the, their baby is not alive, um, they are completely in shock, they are devastated, and it's our responsibility as a professionals to pass the information uh, we have uh, from, we have the information um, from the families that we accompanied in the past, uh, from the associations uh, of families of um, these issues, also the regular trainings we have attended. So there are certain things uh, that we have to take into account we know that they're going to need time, time to understand what happened. Maybe they, not, they need to go home and come back before we induce the labor. Um, they need to be part of the making decisions. Maybe they can decide whether they want to go after the baby is born in a maternity unit or in the postnatal war. And even more important, they need a recognition of their parenthood because this is like a golden time they have. Um, this is the only time they're going to be able to be father and mother of the baby. So we would encourage them to hold the baby, to dress the baby. Um, sometimes they, at the beginning, they, they say, no, we, we can't. Like I remember once we have this family and the baby was born and there was an, the sister of, of, of the father in the room and she stand up and say, I, I'm going to hold the baby because no, this is my niece and, and I can do that. So by facilitating this, eventually an hour later, this family, they could hold the baby. And this, it's going to belong to them, these memories. So if it's very important that we allowed these families to have these moments, as well to collect baby's memories, such as taking pictures um, and other things we put in the memory boxes are like the footprints. If we know, if we know the name of the baby, we would put this baby uh, with the name, was born that day, the weight, and all these sort of things. And because we know how important is the, the care we're going to give to them, uh, we did a little video to raise awareness among the professionals. la complejidad del doloroso proceso eh, que ha de afrontar la familia cuando le toca vivir una pérdida, eh, creemos importante la creación de, de un protocolo sobre, sobre el acompañamiento del duelo perinatal. Este protocolo intenta um, incidir en la parte más, más humana, más de, del acompañamiento a esas parejas. Uh, por ejemplo, en cómo acompañar verbalmente, ¿no? ¿Qué, qué frases decir y qué frases mm, mejor no decir. Otro aspecto que hemos tenido en cuenta es cómo, cómo elaborar un recuerdo para esta familia, un recuerdo que, que al cabo de un tiempo ellos puedan mirar. ¿no? Mm, me refiero al, al quizás pues, pues, a hacer un, un retrato, a hacer una foto un tanto poética. Tuvimos un embarazo que concluyó a las 41 semanas. Uh, fuimos a hacer una visita de rutina uh, el día antes del, del día previsto para el parto y en esa visita nos comunicaron que uh, no escuchaban el latido del corazón de nuestra hija. Y bueno, a partir de ahí nos dimos cuenta que tampoco sabían mucho qué hacer. Lo primero que nos dijeron fue que por favor fuera a aparcar bien el coche y le dieron el mando a distancia del televisor a mi mujer y le dijeron que así podría distraerse. Este es el trato que creo que no se debe dar en, en un hospital en una situación de este tipo. Cuando fuimos a urgencias nos trataron muy bien, nos dijeron varias opciones. Bueno, decidimos aplicar una medicación e irnos para casa. Aquí sí que hubiese agradecido que 
quizá que me explicasen un poquito las cosas mejor y quizá me hubiese gustado que en lugar de decirme que me iban a provocar un aborto, me hubiesen dicho que me provocaban un parto, porque cuando llegué a mi casa, al cabo de unas horas, rompí aguas, me mojé hasta los talones, fue igual como parir a mi hijo, pero con 12 semanas de gestación. Quizá nadie es consciente de que necesitamos hablarlo, con tu propia pareja, con tus hijos, con los vecinos, con los amigos, con los médicos, con quien haga falta. Y bueno, pienso que estaría muy bien que formasen a médicos, enfermeras, comadronas, auxiliares, toda la gente que está en este sector para que pudiesen incluso hacer mejor su faena de lo que ya la hacen, entendernos un poquito más y estar más a nuestro lado. Thank you, Alicinda. Thank you so much for this emotional presentation also. I will call now uh, Maria João Freitas. She's a colleague of mine at uh, an hospital in Lisbon, and she will talk about integrated responsibility centers. Um, hello to you all. Uh, we are uh, happy that you are here to, to assist our uh, project and to hear a, a little bit about what we're doing in Lisbon and thank you Dr. Alexander for the presentation. Mm -hmm. We are dealing in the NHS, in the Portuguese NHS with some uh, challenges and one of them is the high demand pressure that we all uh, are experiencing, experiencing and so uh, uh, and this is uh, transformed and, and read by uh, high uh, waiting lists with high times of resolution. So we, we have come up with a, with a solution that was uh, to, to, make, uh, uh, to make use of an instrument that was initially uh, found to, uh, and initially designed to address the challenges of extensive waiting lists and the average and to improve the average waiting times. And we have given it a wider and a, a broader uh, reading and interpretation. So this has been the, the mobile for uh, the teams to uh, reorganize themselves and to express their willing uh, to the administration board of developing their own projects and to address specific clinical or uh, functional and service delivery problems. So how has this uh, happened? So these multidisciplinary teams, they identify a specific problem and they design a strategy uh, to, to address and to, to help solve that specific problem. Either it is related with the, the volume of service and the conditions of service delivery or a different uh, a strategic clinical approach for a, a, clinical, a specific clinical pathway or a, specifically, a, a specific uh, disease or a health condition problem. So the trigger that uh, uh, is in the epicenter of professionals motivation is, uh, is uh, uh, it varies uh, according to the different specialities. For some, it is uh, uh, the, the possibility of being acknowledged for their work. For some others, is the, uh, the possibility of having, of obtaining improved uh, income. And for others, is the uh, the space to create a specific identity, a specific group identity and image, uh, image of their, their own services. How do we put this into practice? How we, we formalize, how is it possible to formalize this uh, responsibility integrated centers, our CRIS? Uh, so teams gather up, they, they clearly identify the, the problem they want to address, uh, they elaborate uh, an action plan uh, which uh, has a specific structure. It, it, uh, uh, it shows how the historic of service delivery has been uh, during the, the past three years, uh, how they uh, intend to address that specific uh, problem, uh, the, levels, the, the levels of service delivery, the, the, the volume of production is, is put forward, uh, as well as the, the, the team composition. And, and the budget that is necessary to, to deliver that, uh, that project and to put it into practice. This is a three-year uh, action plan uh, commitment. 
and this is accompanied by a specific regulation and uh, there is a, a negotiation process with the administration board so that uh, levels of production uh, but as well the quality indicators of, of, of service uh, can be uh, aligned with the administration board uh, strategy for the overall organization. After a uh, negotiation process, which uh, usually, according to our experience, uh, it, it lasts for some, some meetings and we, we go back and, and produce some, some changes in the document and reflect a little bit more, we come up with, uh, with a specific contract. We, we lay it down on, on a written form and uh, there is a, a really shared uh, risk and commitment between the, the clinic, the multidisciplinary uh, teams, w w which are uh, led by uh, uh, the, the a clinical uh, element, uh, a doctor that a medical doctor that is uh, acknowledged, acknowledged for his experience or her experience, expertise, and and pre prestige, and. Uh, uh, we have this commitment uh, and shared risk for a period of three years. So right now at the uh, Centro Hospitalar Universitario de Lisboa Central, uh, we have uh, come up with, uh, in the last 18 months, we have uh, delivered uh, six CRIs, uh, these that are presented, and we are uh, planning on, on some others. Uh, with a, a more specific uh, target, we have uh, now with, uh, with this uh, one and a half year experience, we, we have uh, been able to produce some, some changes in our process. And these are the ones that are under my direct responsibility. And these are some of the, uh, of the findings uh, that we already have to, to share and, to, and the evidence of what we have been uh, uh, achieving. Uh, we are uh, involved with the, with the community, uh, especially in the hepatitis uh, uh, subgroup of patients. We have established a, a, a more uh, um, proximal relation with the primary yeah. health care. We have invested in technology uh, and we have uh, uh, Re, uh, uh, we have reopened uh, the pediatric ophthalmologic uh, department and we have uh, uh, been able to regain uh, our installed capacity and be able to respond to community's uh, needs. So here are our contacts. Uh, feel free to, to contact us and to visit us if you happen to be in Lisbon. Thank you. Thank you, Marijo. Uh, I will call now Professor Roser Torra. Uh, she's a consultant at Pujibert Foundation at Hospital São Paulo. Good morning. Um, thank you for allowing me to share our experience on rare diseases. Um, I'm. Uh, well, no, it's there. Okay, it went too quickly. Sorry. Oh, come on. I try to go backwards. Is it you? Oh, perfect. Okay. It's there. Oh, come on. Uh, just, just wait a while, just to, to stabilize. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go backwards. I don't know what is it doing. No, I will give you the time. No you do it? Okay. No, Thank you. Yeah. So thanks again for inviting me. I'm, I'm Rosetta, I'm an adult nephrologist uh, specialized in genetic kidney diseases and I'm an enthusiastic of these diseases. And Fundació Puigver is a center devoted to urology, nephrology, andrology and reproductive medicine. Um, reference centers are needed for these rare diseases because it's hard to find expertise uh, for these very infrequent disorders. So there are reference centers at European level, Spanish level, and Catalan level. Now I'm afraid of using that. Okay, at European level, uh, we have the ERNs. At the Spanish level, we have the CESUR and the Catalan level, SHUET. Being the Fundació Puigver, a monographic center, of course, we are very specialized and we are part of all of, the, all of, all of these um, networks. 
the European one, the, the life motive is share, care and cure, and it's a virtual network uh, of healthcare professionals uh, across Europe um, that debate and address uh, these rare diseases and theoretically it should uh, facilitate the cross-border uh, attention for patients. Uh, we are part of Erkanet, which is the kidney one, and Eurogene, which is the urology one. I mean, when I said kidney, I meant nephrology. Uh, the Thesur is the Spanish reference centers. They're not that huge. Uh, they're very focused on procedures, techniques of very rare diseases. And then that allows patients from all over the country to go to that specialized center. So this uh, provides equity in healthcare for these rare diseases across Spain. Uh, we are part of these three uh, Thesur, the crossover renal transplantation, the bladder extrophy, and the complex glomerular disorders. And in Catalonia, it has been explained in another session, we have a very good plan for rare diseases with a very um, good uh, network. It's called SHWEC. And to date, we have uh, that SHWEC for all these diseases, and we are part of the renal one. So being part of all these reference centers needs to do things very good and very high quality. And we don't, want, we don't want to face that. Rare diseases are usually systemic, involve many organs, like tuberous sclerosis, which for the dermatologist is renal uh, skin lesions, for the neurologist is seizures, uh, tumors, for the urologist, kidney tumors, for the nephrologist, blood tests, pills, for the pulmonology, CT scans, uh, pulmonary function tests. But we do not want these patients to be uh, a compilation of appointments, um, a compilation of organs. It's a human being that they're usually young, they study, they work, and we want to take care of them in the best way possible. And this is done through multidisciplinary teams uh, with different specialties being involved, sharing skills and knowledge. Um, all these members together make recommendations that facilitate the patient care. Um, we do the whole clinical management, both physical and psychosocial. We coordinate the visits. As I mentioned, this is very important. We have joint action protocols that we share also with the network. And we meet regularly. And there is a very important uh, position, which is the case manager nurse. Uh, she has a very, very important role uh, making all these uh, procedures uh, working very smoothly. And I, I will share very quickly our experience during the COVID, COVID pandemic. Uh, we maintained the activity, although it was very tough, uh, where we, we had no face-to-face uh, -face, uh, visits with the patients unless it was an urgency. So we, we had to find new resources, we used telephone calls, we had an email for genetic conditions for patients 24, seven hours a day, uh, seven days a week, video conferences, and we always kept in direct contact with patients with the uh, invaluable help of the case manager nurse. Um, professionals had a hard time to handle this uncertainty to convey confidence and security in these tough times we were all very busy taking care of covid patients but we couldn't forget about these patients that felt very lonely most of them were high-risk patients for covid so they were scared at home feeling very alone so we we make a great effort to reach them and and now we are i, I would say that we're almost 95 percent uh, we reached uh, the previous status and, and, and we recovered the follow-ups on individual basis. And that's it. This is an example of, of the multidisciplinary teams and you can see all the specialities that may be involved. The case manager, I put it in the first place because I think it's extremely important. In fact, is a must for all these reference networks. You need to have that position. Uh, nephrology, urology, pneumology, dermatology, neurology, neuroradiology, radiology, Time. psychology, genetics, pediatric nephrology, neurosurgery, neuropediatry, ophthalmology, neuropsychology, pharmacy, ENT. You see, it's quite a complicated mixture of specialities, but it's all, all absolutely needed for dealing and for providing the best care for patients with rare diseases. 
And um, last but not least, I would like to thank all the, um, the uh, medical and patient associations that support um, very strongly rare diseases. As you know, they are orphan. <laughs> not many people know them. And, and they raise awareness and, and the role of patient association is absolutely clue. Um, patients feel uh, they can find peers that have the same problems and they share concerns and it, it's, it's, very, it's very useful. And that's it. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much for, for bringing this experience. Um, now I'm, I will call Dr. Natalia Aloe. She's also coming from uh, Spain, Fundación Sanitaria Mole. Here there's a collection of masks. <laughs> At this point, then. I will ask someone can from... Take uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> there too. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Natalia Yue and I am the head of clinical documentation of Hospital de Mollet. I'm going to talk about a specific project, a little project of our, our center, but it's like an example of kind of what a documentation service can do to, to make knowledge. Okay, and the title is Casuistic and Comorbidity of the Patient with COVID. As we know, the COVID-19 is a disease that mainly causes a respiratory disease with these manifestations. We all know on several cases, it can end up developing a bilateral pneumonia causing acute respiratory distress, acute respiratory failure, even the sepsis and the death of the patient. So several risk factors have been described as favoring a complication or the death of the patient like diabetes, smoking, hyperlipidemia, we know some, some of them, but the studies we detect, they have some biases and limitations, and that was the reason for making our study. We think that having this information in the first moment of the attention of the patient would allow us to define the profile of patient more at risk of getting complicated. So the aims of the study were to describe the patient with COVID-19 disease discharged from Hospital de Mollet in 2020, identify the profile of patient more at risk of getting complicated or death, and analyze the complexity of all the data set. For to do this, we designed a cross-sectional study with all the discharge with the diagnosis of COVID-19 in our center. And the data would be the CMBD in Spanish. It is the minimum basic data set in English. So the center will be Hospital de Mollet. My colleague presents a little bit about our center. It is from Fundación Sanitaria Mollet. It is a regional hospital from the public Catalan system. It is allocated on the metropolitan area of the city of Barcelona and offers attention to 165,000 inhabitants with a staff of 120 beds and a 10 bed semi-critical unit. On the first step of the analysis, we made a global analysis. It was carried out and it detects 1,062 patients with a diagnosis of COVID-19 in 2020. The mean age was 66.5 and the proportion was higher in men. If we look at the discharge as, and the circumstances of discharge, sorry, a 63% went home, a 20% of the patients were transferred to another center and a 14% died. We know that this rate of mortality was higher than in 2019, even more in respiratory disease. If we look at the deceased, the age was higher even more than in the global of the database. The patients that were deaf, they had a mean age of 80.3 years. The proportion went more higher in men. And if we look at the complexity, these patients were more complicated. If we continue with this analysis of the discharge circumstances, we can see that the patients transferred to another center, they had also a higher age than the global. But if we look at the gender, the proportions were similar on male and female. It was 50-50. If we look at the complexity, the patients that were transferred to another center had a higher complexity. It was the highest out of the database. And that was, we can explain it, because the patients transferred to another center need to get an intubation on a higher proportion. On the second phase, we made a bivariate analysis with a T, with a T squared test, sorry. And on the first step, we detect some comorbidities associated to get COVID, and that were hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and arterial hypertension. On this bivariate analysis, 
we describe some risk factors that are associated to die in the patient with COVID, and that were diabetes, chronic renal failure, arterial hypertension, obesity, hyperlipidemia, cardiac pathology, and respiratory pathology, previous pathology. On the last phase of the study, we made a multivariate analysis with a logistic regression, and four factors were described for increases the risk of die in the patient with COVID, and there were diabetes, chronic renal failure, arterial hypertension, and cardiac pathology. It is important to highlight these four factors. I am turned to repeat them. Diabetes, chronic kidney failure, arterial hypertension, and previous heart disease, because as I said, these factors are associated to the death in patients with COVID-19. It is important, though, to detect them in the earlier moment as possible, like in emergencies or primary care, in order to make a closer follow-up of the patients that we detect these complications, because they are more at risk of getting complicated in order to avoid this possible death of, of the patient. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I will call Dr. Ala Alalawati. Uh, he is uh, the head of the Department of the Cardiothoracic Surgery at the National Arts Center. Uh, meanwhile, I ask everyone that is assisting online to use the Q&A in the right side of the screen. Uh, if you want to put some questions or some comments to our uh, speakers and everyone in the room can also use the, um, our Congress app. Dr. Alawai. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ala Alawati. I'm the head of Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the National Heart Center and Royal Hospital, Oman. Today, I'll be sharing with you our experience with reducing the pediatric cardiac surgery wait list at our center. I have no disclosures. Uh, back in 2017, we were faced with an increased number of patients on the pediatric cardiac surgery wait list. We were also faced with the, delayed, with the consequences of delayed surgery. That's increased risk of complications, increased cost that's associated with it, and also the frustration of patients and doctors as a result. Between 2017 and 2018, our wait list increased by 75%, and we've topped 264 patients on our wait list by March 2018. We look deeper at our condition at that time, and we've realized that our capacity allows us to operate a maximum number of nine patients a week. But then we, we receive at least five new patients every week too. Doing the math, we realize that we'll need three years to clear the wait list provided that there is no increase in the demand, which was not the case at all. So something had to be done at that stage. We've set our objective to reduce the pediatric cardiac surgery wait list to less than 60 patients by June 2019. That was almost a year from then. We discovered in no time that this was an ambitious, too ambitious uh, goal. So we've set our date to 2020 and then we modified it to March 2021. We performed the root cause analysis looking into the causes of this long wait list. And we've realized that we have an increase, we have a huge backlog uh, of patients. We've had increase in demand. We have limited ICU beds and limited operating time. We also had issues with our utilization of our own OR. We had increased number of OR cancellation rate and we had issues or challenges with our inventory management. We then decided to tackle every problem and we proposed a solution to every single issue of these. We started with creating a flow service management that streamlined the care of the patients, starting from the scheduling of the patients and ending with the discharge of this, those patients after the surgeries. We've converted to flexible patient scheduling as opposed to fixed patient scheduling. This took into account the weekly ICU bed status and the urgency or the inpatient's urgencies. We've improved our OR utilization through the theater uh, utilization committee. We've reduced or the flow service helped us in reducing the uh, number of cancellations that we had by better preparing those patients for surgery. We also implemented fast track protocols and we've adapted the ICU length of stay benchmarking for common lesions to improve our utilization of resources. So I'll go back here. 
Uh, implementing these measures on their own, we've realized within four months and for the first time, our wait list started declining. We measured a decline of 10 to 15 percent within four months by only implementing these measures. And these measures did not require any additional resources. We then looked into uh, uh, getting extra resources from other parts of the hospital to create a temporary increase in capacity in our workload. So we created that and we, al we were allowed to have a two weeks uh, period uh, in which we had increased ICU beds, increased OR time. So we ran surgical campaigns during those two weeks. We ran two surgical campaigns and we've did the economics of that too. Uh, these two campaigns, each campaign resulted on its own again by, a re by 10 to 15 percent reduction in the wait list. So you can see with all these measures, we had an incremental gain. We came down from 264 to 48 patients by March 2021. This was a huge thing for our team. We've gained other, on other aspects as well. So our OR utilization improved from 60% in 2017 to more than 80% in 2021. And according to the last statistics, we are at 90% actually right now. We, uh, we've reduced our avoidable cancellation rate from 12% in 2017 to 3% in 2021, and we're aiming for zero for next year. All this was done without a compromise on the patient safety measures. We've continued to monitor our specific quality measures, that's mortality and morbidity, benchmark, benchmarked uh, by lesion to the international standards. We're monitoring our adhe uh, adherence to uh, fast track protocols and uh, our safety checklists, and the team is ensuring appropriate patient flow and appropriate uh, discharge planning. As a continuous follow-up actions, we will continue to monitor our outcomes, track the wait list, ensure staff well-being, uh, so no burnout for staff, and now we're introducing ERAS in the congenital cardiac surgery, which is the new thing in the field. The innovative, innovative contribution to policy and practice in this project materialized to us to consolidate the importance of the flow management service. This made the difference and create a huge impact on our patient care. We've improved our utilization of resources and our surgical campaign set new benchmarks in patient care and allowed us to introduce new concepts into the team such as bloodless cardiac surgery. I would like to thank my co-authors in this paper, and I would like to thank all the team members who contributed to this project. Some of them are in the room here today. Without you, nothing this would have been achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I will call now um, Nils Domenek Oller. She's uh, what we call, uh, she's Chief Innovation Officer. She's probably uh, what we would call uh, e-nurse because she has a, uh, she is so focused in innovation. Um, I will, all, all our presentations are quite different. Um, so I will ask also our speakers to think at the end for the Q&A. I will ask you mostly to present one enabler of our projects that we can share with our colleagues that could be the main, the, the main topic for your, uh, for your project. So the main enabler to implement your projects, okay? Please go on. Thank for you. Yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. It's attending is conference and exper uh, experience for you. I am Neus Domènech, it's Chief Innovation of the Fundació Hospital Dolot i Comarcal de la Garrotxa. Uh, close to you, close to your project, was born with the aim of a compare breast cancer patient who are undergoing chemotherapy at our center. The, col the collaboration between Hospital Dolot and the Catalan company Yacid Robotic have made this project possible. The breast cancer, most common tumor in women around the world. According to the World Health Organization, more than 20 million cases were reported in 2020. And about one in the 12 women will suffer from it's their timeline. In Hospital Dolot, together with the M of Oncologists of the Catalan Institute of Oncologists, the first chemotherapy treatment began in 2020. Since then, the center has been consolidated as a center of reference in discipline coordinated by Breast Pathology Unit. 
In 2020, 70 women were diagnosed in, in disease at the hospital. On over the age, each patient has uh, 12 and 50 seasons from this process and the app of a total of 350 treatments by 2020. Uh, taking advantage of the experience of the breast pathology unit professional of our center and the impetus of new technologies to modify to the model of health care and social care. The opportunity was to take the Dumanis chemotherapy treatment of breast cancer. At the same time, we give through field information and adapt it to the treatment each woman. The Close to You project uh, uses Amazon Voices device through artificial intelligence to detect the conscious and needs of people who are going through this process during the chemotherapy seasons. In order to offer the most appropriate advice or consolidate the uses, a uh, variable of number and age, proce processing sessions, claiming physical and statement, physical and dietary change, are the breast, as well as this our history. Then, in an intelligent and automatic way, and using an algorithm between more 20 and 50 interactive videos. The most appropriate and personalized videos for each occasion is chosen. The context videos consist on different topics such as the, the, the breathing, the treatment, the physical and instrumental case, and the effects of treatments. The participants or the professionals with them and have con contact during this, this disease. The technical par uh, partner of the project is Yasik Robotic. They have led the program in development of the algorithm and the way in users respond to these videos in order to find the full, uh, full, full one. Therefore, each video is the same with uh, which or percentages of interest this breakfast in the, uh, to the value and the question. When the total percentages have been ideal, those videos are displayed whose zoom in the rest. The usability tests have begun in October and they will be placed in the individual boxes where the treatments are carried out. When the tests have been performed, each patient will be used this service uh, voluntarily. Thank you for your attention. It's Miss Contact. Thank you so much. I will call now Senora Zoe Herrera Perez. She's going to talk us about uh, unitary action on World Diabetes Day in an urban territory. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, thank you very much, and very glad to be here with all of you sharing our experience. Uh, I am Zoe, I am a family physician, and I'm working here in Barcelona in a primary care center in one of the districts of the city. I'm going to explain to you what we did uh, in 2019 uh, in relation with diabetes. You know that there are more than 400 million adults that uh, are living with diabetes. And in 1991, the WHO and the IDF decided to promote a special action to, uh, in, as, a, as the most important aim in the World Diabetes Day, uh, try to be the leading platform to promote diabetes awareness and also try to put diabetes in the spotlight of all the uh, social, sanitary and political actions. Because of this, we thought that could be interesting to do something uh, two years ago. The objective of the campaign of the year during the 2019 was uh, to increase awareness of the impact of diabetes in the families, how uh, to promote a role of the family in the management, care, prevention, education, and uh, keeping touch with people with diabetes in the families. 
So what we did, we did to do, uh, we decided to uh, create a special action. Uh, all the primary care centers of our area, I will explain you right now, and also the uh, hospital uh, diabetes units to sensitize the population and also the professionals in what's diabetes, the um, um, most uh, quickly um, evaluation of the risk of diabetes, and also to improve the best way and uh, styles of life to avoid this illness. Who are we? We are uh, an integrated uh, health area in Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona City is divided in four uh, uh, integrated health areas with different, uh, that attended a lot of population. And uh, the role that has these uh, areas are to coordinate and work together between all the partners that are attending this population. Uh, in these areas, I will show you now in this uh, slide, uh, you see we are the green area. There are more than 20, we are 20 primary care centers, um, three hospitals, and also Hospital San Juan de Deo as our pediatric reference hospital. Also, there are uh, mental health centers and socio-sanitary um, centers. And uh, in these areas, there are many, they are designed clinical groups of different specialities with a lot of professional, multi-professional groups. Uh, and we are trying to uh, design and elaborate um, procedures and drugs to attend better our population. What we did, we designed uh, this action. We talked to all the directions of the primary care centers and all the endocrine uh, units, diabetic units. Uh, we also did a draft and we presented it to the um, ethical, community, uh, ethical Committee of Hospital Clinic, which is our reference hospital. And also, we uh, tried to uh, describe some different activities that uh, in all our centers were going to be done. Like, for example, different um, tables, different uh, eating sessions, explaining how to eat better, um, walking uh, on the neighborhoods, etc. After that, we designed some posters also. Uh, we designed all the material that we were going to um, present and have in all the tables that we um, organized in the front of our centers. And also, we prepared um, a special post-intervention survey. What we did uh, with the defined risk uh, survey. We designed this uh, survey on paper and also in an online platform um, with all the data protected by the hospital clinic server. And we sent this uh, survey in all our uh, websites and also in the um, social networks. And during the World Diabetes Day, all the professionals in their offices uh, offered to the people that were going there if they wanted to do that uh, questionnaire and answer that. Also, we adapted the posters and uh, put it on our uh, centers. Results that we found it. We had uh, the, uh, all the diabetes unit hospitals participated. 75% of the primary care centers were here. You can see that 68% of women asked this uh, survey. Obesity, 16% uh, is important. And high and very high risk in the fine, uh, the fine risk test was approximately 14% of the results. So we think that it's very interesting and useful to do unitary actions uh, in primary care centers and also in hospitals, multi-professionals, giving all us the same messages to detect the risk of having diabetes, to detect people with uh, diabetes in uh, the early stages, and also to promote healthy habits uh, to prevent uh, the incidence and prevalence. These are some photos of what we did. And when we were trying to analyze all the survey post-intervention, what happened? Everybody knows what happened in 2020. We had to stop doing that. We had to, we had to work. Uh, we had to attend people having COVID disease also. Um, and we had to uh, um, improve all the, all the work of vaccinating the population. 
Uh, this was a hard work that we did uh, all in the primary care centers too. So this project was a stopped, so we couldn't analyze this data. The, in, in fact, you are maybe the first ones you are seeing what we did and uh, what, what we thought after the situation, uh, the epi epidemiologic uh, COVID situation has been getting a little bit better. We wanted to repeat it. We are very tired, but a few weeks ago, the clinical group of endocrinology, we met by teams and we decided to do something. In fact, tomorrow, because the World Diabetes Day is the November 14th, tomorrow in all the primary care centers of our area and also in the three hospitals, we are going to do something. We haven't got time to organize posters and we haven't got time to send the find risk survey because the population now is receiving a lot of information of the flu campaign, vaccination campaign, and also we are vaccinating with the third dose of COVID. So people is a little bit tired, but we will try to do something tomorrow. Hope we can see in a few weeks how has it been going and we will try to uh, do it better for next year. Uh, our team is quite, uh, we, we are many people there. We are very happy to be here with you and thank you very much. Muchas gracias and enjoy Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Perez. Um, as I told you, I would, we are quite uh, in our schedule, we are quite tight. As you know, we have the closing ceremony at 2 p.m. also. Um, so I would like from our speakers, I, I don't have any questions from the, from the participants. So I would like you to mention, I would ask Casco for the mic. And I would like to hear you mostly saying what were the, most, the main enabler to your uh, amazing projects that you presented here today. Uh, can you, just for the speakers, please. Or if you have some questions from the room also, which, please. No, we can start by the time. Yeah, this was just a question, uh, and it, it relates to a wider topic. Uh, the gentleman from Saudi Arabia, uh, I was quite interested with the range of uh, competences and skills that are required of a leader. Practically every leader comes with uh, three or four critical competences. It's just a fact. So generally, you know, every leader is going to come with core competences. Uh, the balance of the gaps are filled by the management team. So I'm just curious, uh, has that been considered in the range of things you're doing? And I think this issue relates not just to hospital leaders, but to all leaders that uh, generally it's about three to five skill sets. Uh, so do you have any sort of comment on that? Are there some critical core skill sets you must have versus having a list of 15, 20 ideal skill sets? Well, we're talking mostly about behaviors, but I agree with you. The team should complement the leader. But here we're presenting the ideal uh, leader with all the behaviors that he should possess. Of course, no one will achieve 100%, but some will have a weakness in some areas and weakness in other areas. They could work on their weaknesses. They could strive to be the best leader they can themselves, but it's definitely going to come back to a team. That's why we talk about collective leadership instead of individual leadership. But this model is a good guide for us to develop our programs, to design the components of the programs, and to guide uh, any developmental plans that are put together by, w between us and individuals. Awesome. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, just a, a small comment on this is the, the, the International Hospital Federation also has, as you know, a special interest group and the management competencies. And there is also a framework for training, as, uh, as you know, that actually was adopted by several um, regional organizations. And uh, anyone that wants to have more information, please contact the Secretariat. Uh, because there is an intense work from this special interest group uh, on this in healthcare management competencies. Okay. Um, so I, I would ask uh, to, to pass the mic to our speakers, mostly to present, uh, and if you don't have any more questions from the room. No? So the main enabler in your projects, what was the, the X factor in your projects to, to be implemented? 
the um, enabling factor for the implementation, yeah. is it so? Okay, well, uh, for us, it was mostly a research-based project, but I would say one of the biggest enabling factors is uh, twofold. So, uh, gender equity lens, as well as uh, multi-sectoral or multi-disciplinary uh, um, activism on the subject. So, thank you. I think, for me, the enablers were the people themselves, understanding the issues and uh, making, uh, making them understand the issues, involving them in decision making, uh, presenting data to our uh, leadership uh, in the hospital. Um, one thing that we worked hard on uh, for the first year is like when you're faced with such a problem, you'll ask for more resources, more resources will solve your problem. Uh, hospital administration cannot provide that. So for full year, we worked on improving our utilization of our own resources, and then we moved into mobilization re of resources from other, uh, from other areas. And I think people, people what made a difference to us. Thank you so much. I will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Close to You project, it's, uh, it's very important for the, uh, compare the patients in women, women cancer. Uh, it's nova technology for the compare the treatment chemotherapy. Uh, well, in in my case, I I want to highlight uh, for our project is that there is a way for health institutions to to contribute to the social needs in for the citizens for all territory, and that's a good way to to work. Okay, I talk about COVID. I tell the four factors associated to the diet, but I'm, I would like to say it also that the importance to analyze the data set we have in the hospitals. We have a lot of data. It's difficult every day to analyze it, but we have to make our data set and analyze in order to get information and prevent to our patients the complications. Hi, I talk about the um, prenatal loss, and I think we as a society, uh, we still have to make an effort to visualize this this um, to this this issue, and putting the, these families um, in the center of care. It's the first step to to meet their needs, and we as professionals um, we have to act as an advocate for them, and we have to help them to raise the the boys. So uh, for me, uh, uh, the main enabler or the critical factor was in fact the, the administration board's vision uh, and the detection of the, the need to produce some organizational uh, transformation and some changes and allowing the professionals to lead that change. I think we can go look at or the Well, for me, maybe the most important thing is that the, um, the unitary strategies are very important in the community in conjunction all people also, the community and the professionals to increase awareness in many illness. And if we work together, primary care centers and also hospitals, this relationship will, will help more to prevent and promote uh, health habits. Uh, I focused on, on rare diseases and highlight the necessity of having reference centers to allow all patients uh, affected from a rare disease to get the best care possible. And for, for this purpose, the need of, of uh, multidisciplinary teams is, is uh, really a must. Thank you. For me, I think uh, one of the biggest enablers for this kind of training is creating the mindset and the mind shift actually where people realize that technical training is as important as management and leadership training. Uh, the second thing is probably uh, having organization invest in this kind of development. And the third thing is having international collaborations like this. So this is why we're at the IHF and this is why we're collaborating with the IHF to create this network of like-minded people who are interested in developing new leaders who can manage through the next 100 years or so. Well, thank so, you so much. Thank you.
So uh, mostly I will need to, to end. I will invite you to go to the closing ceremony that is starting now. Uh, and for the ones that are leaving, have a safe travel home uh, with, to your loved ones and uh, to continue your amazing work. And for the colleagues from Catalonia, thank you so much for hosting us and continue this magnificent work that you are doing here to improve the healthcare of uh, all. Thank you so much.